Hey everyone, thank you for joining our latest talks at Google. My name is Kemi Shokumbi. I currently am a part of the Google Enterprise Risk Management Team, and I also serve as the global lead for the Africans at ERG. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Idris Sandu. And if you don't know who he is, it's someone you definitely want on your radar for the future. But just as a brief introduction, Idris is an architectural technologist seeking to level the playing field for fellow African youth and other marginalized communities. He's worked with the likes of Nipsey Hussle to uh, Off-White and Louis Vuitton's Virgil Abloh, and he's been making waves since even before he was 18. But in addition to his work in the creative space, Idris is extremely passionate about using emerging technology to create unique and sustainable solutions to impact the most vulnerable communities in society, which we'll actually talk, touch on a little bit during this talk as well. But with that, I'd like to welcome Idris. Hi, Idris. Hi, Kemi. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you, thank you. And before we dive in, I'll just let everyone know that we will be taking questions at the end. So feel free to you know, add questions in the live chat and we'll be filtering through those and post them up and ask Idris some of those. So sure, sure. just to get started, Idris, I know I introduced you as an architectural technologist. And I think you know, for those who haven't heard that term before or are not familiar with you, could you just start by just explaining like, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so it's really interesting because um, when I first started identifying as an architect, even though I, I do practice actual architecture, like building things and supervising the construction of them, um, I more so resonated with the verb definition of it instead of the noun definition. Because when you even embody your work within a noun, it's limited by the limitations of the noun definition, right? So you mentioned architect and someone thinks about, oh, somebody that makes buildings. You mentioned technologist, someone thinks about someone that builds technology. But one thing that I love about either identifying as an architect or architectural technologist as a verb is it's an ongoing process. It's an iterative process that never ends. And you're able to cover so much landscape, right? Because architecture deals with physical and digital systems. Technology deals with hardware and software. They're both very parallel journeys. So for me, that term embodies pretty much everything um, about me and, and just how uh, I, you know unconventional I am with my approaches instead of defining myself by the noun version of it, I get to now live within this verb space, which is an ongoing and continuous cycle that never ends. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, this was some knowledge. Uh, <laughs> and we'll definitely talk about like, you know, the unique, you know, nature of your work later on. But um, just to even before we dive in, like, I just want to talk about your journey and how you got here. So to say, I mean, you've, like we said, you've accomplished so much even at your young age and clearly like, you know, like you said, it's an ongoing journey. So there's so much more in store to come. You know, what would you define as like kind of that pivotal moment when you said like, okay, like things are really shaping up for me. Like what was that moment that really defined how you got here to where you are today? I think um, in 2017, uh, the beginning of 2017, uh, when I collaborated with Nipsey Hussle, I think that was the shift for me. Because prior to that, I was, you know, working with all these different uh, politicians in LA. I was working with, you know, like Joe Buscaino, Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA. I was working with Maxine Waters, Barbara Boxer, Isidore Hall. I was working with a lot of people in, in the political space. But I realized that the, the, the impact ratio for creating technology in that space was limited because it scales very slowly. But I think, you know, Starting at Google and working with all these tech companies all before the age of 18, working with, right? Um, I think one of the things that always stuck out to me was, you know, that kid that is in the hood, that kid from Compton, that kid that grew up on a laundry just like me, um, wasn't really getting the messaging because that kid thought that I went to a super private school. I had access to, you know, private teachers that were teaching me some of these programming languages. When in reality, I was a kid that had to learn JavaScript and I was like learning Fortran. I was learning assembly, which is a very low level programming language used to create operating systems. But even in Compton, I wasn't getting those books, right? So I think in, in 2017 is when I was like, you know, yeah, I'm, I have an opportunity to collaborate with large scale companies and everything, but the true impact is in going back to the communities and empowering the next generation and giving them the right tools to know that they don't have to be like me or they don't have to be the next Steve Jobs or they don't have to be the next, they could be the next them. And as long as we give them the tools, they can widen the scope of how technology is perceived, right? Most of us hear um, technology or we hear uh, mainstream tech or whatever. And the first thing we think about is like Palo Alto or, or there's specific areas that we designate it to. But technology has been created very linearly. Mainstream technology in the last like 15 years has been created linearly. It's come from one place. 
But who's to say that the next major innovation in artificial intelligence or volumetric capturing or spatial reality can't come from Boyle Heights or can't come from Compton or can't come from Atlanta? Um, no one can indefinitely tell you yes or no because the world hasn't seen that. So in 2017, collaborated with Nipsey Hussle was sort of that proposition into the culture to say, hey, technology has been given a very linear way uh, or we've perceived it a very linear way. The vertical integration of it in itself has come from a very linear perspective. We want to now bro uh, broaden and widen the audience and provide the tools for all kids of all walks of life everywhere um, to be able to create on that level. Mm -hmm, for sure, for sure. So you have two companies that you have like Ethos DNA, you have Spatial Lab. So can you discuss how, you know, the work that you just described is conducted through those companies or what their mission is and how it ties to all of that? Yeah, so um, interestingly enough, uh, there's actually three companies. One of them is secret, secret if people don't know about, and if people you just, definitely- you could, you, could, you could premiere it here on live. Yeah, we could, we could, we could premiere it. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, so I'll do that one last. Um, so uh, Ethos DNA um, is a company that stands for ethos, right? So having a design ethos, a set number of principles, DNA standing for design, nature, and access, right? So every single thing that we do within ethos, the consultations that we provide with you know, our different clients all has to do with design, nature, and access. Um, in fact, I did a TED talk about two and a half years ago where I introduced this new concept that I incorporated into all of my work. It's called aspirational necessitation. I know it's a lot, but breaking it down, it basically just deals with, it's a made up word, by the way, but it, it, <laughs> it deals with uh, technology from thinking about how you can apply the 5% of technology that's usually attributed for aspirational products and apply that to the 95% of products that are mostly used by the masses. Because in the world that we live in today, it's the other way around. The aspirational products, the products that most people cannot afford are the products that are designed very well. R&D is, I mean, heavy am amounts of money is invested in those for R&D and things of that, of, of that nature. When in reality, the things that most people use, majority of the economy, majority of society uses that becomes a necessity based thing for them are designed very, very poorly, okay. right? So it was about, how can I take this information uh, that I've received, you know, working in collaboration with partners like Twitter, Uber, Google, and, and, and Facebook, how can I take that information, that high level of quality that's applied, and how can I democratize that, right? And that's how the company was, that became the ethos, that's how the company was, uh, was built. And so we apply aspirational necessitation in design nature and access. So we study biomimicry, we, uh, we, we study how plants interact with each other. Uh, we, uh, you know, last uh, last year we did an art installation that was actually uh, based off of a neural network, but that neural network, the configuration of the neural network was heavily visually uh, inspired by ants and how ants communicate. So we, we, we think of design uh, as a, not just as a end product, but a process and more importantly, a way of life. Design is not a thing that you do, it's a way that you live. And so we, we, we do our best to transcend that. Now, Spatial Labs, on the other hand, is a company that holds all those same ethos, but Spatial Labs was specifically created to be the next big thing in, uh, I, I would just say in communication, right? And the reason why I started Spatial Labs is because we've been doing a, a lot of machine learning, uh, image recognition, slam detection, um, a lot of, you know, for those that aren't familiar, there's there's like different spectrums that uh, immersive reality experiences sit on, right? You're either on, you know, sort of like this VR, which stands for virtual reality, or you're kind of on this AR, right? And then we have MR, which is a co cohesion of both of these, right? Cohesion of both of these. Um, we started Spatial Labs because we felt that if any company could really push the needle of mainstream volumetric uh, technology, spatial reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, it would come from the culture, right? And the reason why I make such a bold statement is because if we look at hip hop culture, if we look at African culture, you have a huge spread throughout the whole entire world, right? Um, but in most cases, even the people that are in the music industry are not building the platforms. They're simply mm -hmm. utilizing the platforms. Mm -hmm. So if you think about hip hop in itself, hip hop is a startup. It hasn't fully vested yet. It hasn't fully produced products yet. It's produced services, subsets of services, but there's no like hip hop product. There's no hip hop service, right? We started to see a change with that with things like um, Tidal that Jay started, you know, which is a software as a service. And that's the next wave. But we're really focusing and thinking about how spatial reality 
created by those that create entertainment in, in itself would cause the biggest revolution in mainstream entertainment, right? Because it's coming from the perspective of utilization through creation rather than utilization through consumption. And so Spatial Labs, that's that's really our, our mission statement. That's all I can share right now. We, we've partnered with Fenty and Migos and Versace and all these different brands this, this, uh, this year alone, just to make a statement that brands are thinking about all these things, right? But the way that it's going to really break through is by democratizing the access of the technology and putting it in the hands of more people. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I, I want to dive into, you know, the ethos aspect and your, you know, um, you call it aspirational resuscitation. But before we get into that, um, just, you know, closing out on the creative space. And I know this is titled Black Creatives. And I think we can think of creatives in two different ways, the literal creatives in the sense like you work with a lot of you know, heavy hitters in the fashion and music space, but also creative in your unique solutions that will create actual Necessitation, necessitation, <laughs> yeah, of um, certain core products in people's lives. But um, on the creative aspect, you know, how do you how do you get into that mode? Like, how do you even start to envision like some of the like you know, you know, platforms of augmented reality that you created for like Fenty or even the virtual store for Nipsey Hustle? How do you even begin to like enter that space personally and get in that creative kind of mindset? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's a very important. I, there's two classes that I think everyone in technology should take. There's two, two classes. Um, uh, one of them is a, a class on design, right? Just like whether you're doing front end, back end, full stack, whatever, you should take a class on design. And whether you're in programming or not, you should take a class on design. And another to me is sort of like journalism, right? It's like, why journalism? Because journalism teaches you a lot of things. One of those things being empathy, right? And the ability to put yourself in the perspective of not only the reader, but the person or the community you are writing about, right? And so I think my approach to creating technology or working or collaborating with people is very journalistic, right? I don't just come and say, hey, I have this amazing idea and your brand can benefit from it, which I think a lot of collaborators or tech companies get into that box where they create this amazing thing and then they plug people into it, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually do the other way around. Uh, we have all these loose ideas and then we specifically target a specific person and then we figure out how we can integrate that ecosystem around what they are focused on or what they are thinking of focusing on. And whether it was the fancy thing or the Migos thing or you know, earlier this year when we partnered with Versace and, and, or Prada, um, it wasn't just like, hey, we have this amazing idea. Um, or even as far back as uh, collaborating with Nipsey Hussle, um, you know, that program that I created, the algorithm that I wrote for geofencing and geolocation based tagging, it could have been, it could have ended up in a smartphone or it could have ended up as another feature uh, with company X or company Y. Um, but to be, the ability to take something like that, and at that time, uh, something at, in 2017, you know, people were doing AR here and there. But to take planar detection, geofencing, and augmented reality and fuse those together and say, hey, we're creating this for this artist. And even that process, before Nipsey and I sat down and talked about tech, we connected over culture. I shared that I was Ghani and I sh uh, he shared that he was Eritrean. We talked about Dr. Seb. We, we talked about um, uh, uh, Kardashev and the Kardashev scale and how we can get hip hop to a type one civilization as a culture. Uh, he took me to his community. I met his sister. I met his mom. I, he said, you know, this is where I don't know how much we can share. You know, he's like, this is where this happened, you know, in, uh, on, on Slauson. This is where this happened. And so I was able to immerse myself, spatial reality. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, in school, even when you're, when you, when you're in kindergarten, uh, a lot of schools or teachers, they teach you these concepts of um, uh, basic spatial concepts, right? So knowing how far things are from you, knowing what objects when you come close to them will burn you, things like that. And so before we get to the technology of spatial reality, that process in itself for me is a spatial reality. Mm -hmm. Going to someone's community, learning about their culture, learning about their ethics, learning about you know uh, different history points uh, throughout their lives, the pain points that they go through, and then figuring out how I can take the technology and build around that and weave it as a, as a fabric into this garment that they already have rather than saying, hey, I have this really cool thread and we can make anything from it, right? It's like, mm -hmm. no, you have this beautiful garment. 
let me figure out how to create a silhouette and weave it into this beautiful you know thing that you already have and let it coexist instead of you know sort of like try and layer over it right mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's how i come up with majority of the ideas it's really this collaborative end but it's really a humbling experience because we never seek out to replace we only seek out to coexist with mm -hmm. um so every collaboration in the past and future um, is based on that principle alone. And that's how I get into the zone. Because sometimes if you're just focusing too much on the idea, um, you'll miss the point, right? And sometimes too, if you're focusing only on the individual, you'll also miss the point. So okay. it's about the perfect balance and understanding why you create instead of, hey, I have all these skill sets. I can make this, I can make this, I can make this. You have to really laser target and focus. But that discernment on how to do that should be based off of sort of that journalism piece, which is the empathy of, understanding what you're creating for who you're creating and why you're creating it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful, particularly like in the engineering space where it's like numbers, formulas, it's very like matter of fact and like scientific, mathematical, but you injecting like, you know, we have UX designers, we have things like that, but injecting that level again of ethos, like you said, directly into the engineer's kind of mindset. I think that that's so powerful and really creating tools that you know, actually have meaningful impact in people's lives as opposed to just building, right? So I think that that's really powerful for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so you. talking about, you know, again, we spoke about, you know, your affinity for the creative space and things like that, but we did start to talk about this ethos and, you know, building sustainable designs and things of that nature for, you know, the critical mm -hmm. tools and services that people use in their day-to-day -day lives. So, you know, going back to the concept of aspir aspirational necessitation, um, you also mentioned in your um, most recent Entrepreneur Magazine um, interview about the concept of uh, empathy-based entrepreneurship. So can you like expand a little bit more on that as well for those who may not have read the article? Like how does aspirational necessitation fit into that and what more does it add to that conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, that, that's such a great question. And I was actually even just having a discussion with this with a partner. Um, the thing about empathy is, um, I think, especially now in the last, I, I would say the last five years that this thing has become a, a huge thing, right? Like empathy, HID, human interface design, material design, like, you know, all these different uh, concepts of design, there's been an emphasis on empathy only being good, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing with empathy is empathy can actually be used against you as well, right? Um, you can have instances where companies can create a product because it's purging on your insecurities, right? Oh. The empathy of, well, I'm creating this to give you something, but in reality, I know I'm getting so much more from it, or I know you'll keep coming back to me for this, right? Okay. So I think when I did that article and I said, we need more empathy-based design, it went back to say, there's so many people that, you know, focus on the numbers or focus on the data, when in reality, you know, I have this book, it's called The Algorithmic Leader. And one thing that I, I love about it is it has this one principle. It's like the Dita Rams of technological advancements, the 10 principle. And I think like the seventh one says, um, when in doubt, think as a human, not an algorithm, right? And we have so many people inherently because we live in this data aggregated world that will think as an algorithm versus a, a human, right? So if you ask a computer in reality, um, if we create a sophisticated system and ask it, how do we end environmental or a global warming or climate change? The most obvious answer is, well, humans create da, 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 so just kill all the humans and then your problem is solved, right? But that's a very algorithmic way of thinking, right? It does solve the problem, okay. right? But it doesn't have the effects that we would want it to, right? We're not getting to the solution the way that we are. So when we start thinking of not just programming empathy or logic, because in reality, we, we're still within the weak AI stage. We're not in strong AI yet, which is at least 20, 15 to 20 years away. Mm -hmm. Within the weak AI stage, we can still program logic that favors empathy right over everything else. And specifically within entrepreneurship, the, the skill set around creating for change, uh, forward innovation versus you know, behind based innovation, I think uh, we, we have a lot of work to do in that in that space. Um, Is and, that like and, pro proactive versus reactive? So yes, like proactive react versus reactive, right? And is what you're creating actually solving a problem or is it creating 
more problems in itself. Um, so I think, you know, with entrepreneurs um, that are thinking or have startups or, or whatever, the longevity is going to come from empathy. You know, the, uh, what the, I was having a conversation with someone and I was telling them how it's interesting how COVID came in and despite everything that it caused, it forced every single company, it forced every single startup, every single entrepreneur to incorporate empathy as a bylaw within their business model. You have to do it now. If you don't even incorporate empathy, if you don't submit to the will of empathy within your company in itself, your company will get left behind, right? Because now the, the user is now thinking from an empathetic space when they even use your service, right? So when I'm, whether it's touching that touch screen or being in public or going, visiting that restroom and having to think things, companies have to think, hey, how do we minimize people from physical contact uh, to not only protect them but to protect ourselves right so you can see even what i just mentioned related to empathy being used on both sides of the spectrum a company might think of incorporating empathy into their business language or their uh their, their product design or whatever um to mitigate uh, mitigate, uh, mitigate risk for the business right but a company might also say hey um we're going to use empathy for the user, right? We're going to think about the user in mind and protecting them when they use our services as well. Mm -hmm. So I think whether, you know, empathy is a tool in itself, it can be used for the greater good or it can be used for, for other reasons as well. But providing that choice and more people at least incorporating that choice within or, or knowing that that choice exists, I think is a great leap and a step forward um, and, and not only how we design, how we develop, how we communicate uh, in the future, uh -huh. in the present too. Yeah, a lot of what I'm hearing from that is like, you know, using empathy either as a tool for dependency, so to say, on that company or um, for the actual like, you know, improvement of someone's life, right? You say like you teach a person to fish, things like that, right? So they're, they can become more independent, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, related to that, I think, you know, it's also very you mentioned COVID, but another thing that has been really, you know, of uh, top of mind in front of, uh, you know, everyone's um, news cycle has been around Black Lives Matter, obviously. Um, and I wonder, you know, if you could speak a little bit about, you know, this empathetic entrepreneurship and the aspirational resuscitation and how we can use that in the technology space to advance the Black Lives Matter agenda, right? Like how, and you, and you talk about biases, you, well, you alluded to it and things like that. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and you know, creating less dependency and kind of more independence in the Black community in the space. That's a very great question. And I think there's two sides of, uh, let's think of it, uh, well, actually let's think of it quantumly because there is two sides and then there's a middle and then there's everything else in between, right? So. On a spectrum, um, if we if we look at just two two sides, right? We we say um, a long term solution and a and a and a, and a short term solution and a longer term solution and everything else in between, right? Um, I think the 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 short term solution is us thinking about how we can incorporate our design language, our culture, uh, embedded into some of these companies that we work at or we work with, right? And I think there are so many different ways of doing that. Um, you know, we had been discussing a, a collaboration with Pantone, for example, where we wanted to create a new color palette that was based off of traditional, like, you know, African um, patterns. So we had the Kente cloth, we had the, you know, Nigerian garbs. And we were thinking about incorporating all these different symbols into creating a new color palette um, that can actually be shipped uh, to a lot of tech companies as they're iterating or creating stuff as it relates to the diaspora in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the short term, um, we need to really understand and realize the importance of what we do towards innovation. And one thing that I, um, I think I've seen a lot of, it's not every, it's obviously not everyone, um, but I feel that even historically, right, um, there's been a lot of trauma ovation versus innovation, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so what you probably like, what does that mean? Well, the traumavation comes from the perspective that um, as it relates to technology, as it relates to design, it always feels like, um, not always, but a lot of times it feels like we we inherently have to create from the perspective of catching up versus uh, leading and carrying the torch for the next person. Um, and it happens in, 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 for example, when it comes to facial recognition, you know, software, right? 
um, I, and a lot of founders that that I've met that have been working on anything in uh, you know relating to facial recognition have always told me that you know um, uh, I, the, the way that platforms exist right now or blah, blah blah whatever they're not that great at detecting darker pigmentation levels. So we want to fix that, right? Which is great, but it's coming from traumavation, meaning you're catching up. So it's like you're just fixing all the broken pieces while other companies are, or whoever is just m producing more things and we're only playing catch up. And we build a whole industry on traumavation, right? And so I think one thing that I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been uh, sort of exploring is how do we balance out creating for the diaspora, creating for Africa, but also realizing that we need to create for everyone, right? And if something is not fixed, it's an opportunity for us to create something even better all while fixing everything else in between, right? Because inherently bias comes from the focus of one group, right? No matter what it is, right? But we live in a society where there is fair bias and unfair bias, right? So it's like, you know, if I'm just inherently only going to care about these type of people, I'm biased towards those set of people. But if somebody else comes in and sees my bias towards these people and says, hey, I'm going to be biased towards these people that you're not representing, they're also inferring bias as well. But their bias was reactionary based off of my bias, mm. which in itself makes them the bias. But instead of focusing just on them, addressing the issue that exists, addressing and saying, hey, this um, this algorithm or the way that this this this, you know, this thing computes is uh, inherently biased or whatever it might be. And we're going to fix it as well as all these other issues that we think can happen in the future for other groups, right? I think that's how we approach things. But we live in a society now where it's about identifying one group and then being cool with it, and then another group and then being cool with it, and then being another group. When in reality, we should be building platforms that are diverse from the ground up. And any company or any individual or any entrepreneur that doesn't have a diverse set of individuals, principles, and ways of life from the ground is inherently biased. And as it relates to technology, I think it's really important for us to mention that technology has no bias, right? It's It can't be biased. It's a tool. You can choose what you want to do with the technology, right? Programs can be biased only because of the bias of the one developing on them, right? But as it exists, code isn't biased. It's the programmer that programs the code that can infer bias, right? So I think like, you know, we hear in this industry a lot of tech bias, tech bias, tech bias, but I don't think it's actually about that. I think it's about those that are building the technologies, right? Because you could also have bottlenecked biases as well. And by that, I mean, sometimes we only think about software. Majority of people that talk about any form of bias are mostly talking about software bias, mm -hmm. right? Um, but hardware bias exists as well, right? Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the original uh, cameras, they were uh, they were created for people of lighter complexions, right? They had a very difficult time. You'd, so you had like white balance and things like that, all these different settings, which still exists in cameras now. It's just now they found a different way to uh, uh, name it. But that's a hardware bias. The actual hardware is bottleneck. So you can be a developer or you can be an engineer or a designer that wants to democratize whatever technology. And you can, your, your software, your algorithm or your code might actually be great, um, but it's bottlenecked by the hardware that actually doesn't even allow for detecting certain pixels or, or, or whatever it might be in the case of, um, uh, if, we, if we look at machine learning, for example, if I'm using, I don't know, a TensorFlow or Azure or whatever it might be for real time face detection and it's measuring the, different pixel variations if it can't detect if the camera can't detect you know my or if it's blurry even if the camera is a 420 pixel camera i'm not going to get the best results right so you can just see how inherently there is different levels but it ultimately changes when companies uh, innovate from the perspective of providing access to all rather than hey we're we're, we're going to just focus on this and when it becomes big of an issue, then we'll discuss it. Because let's remind ourselves that in technology, the minority isn't the minority as it relates to computation, right? Um, problems aren't fixed unless they become bugs or unless they become part of the majority of problems that need to be fixed, right? So I think it's these types of not only design thinking ethos, but it's this type of understanding of the difference between traumavation and innovation and the difference between 
being proactive and reactive, that's really going to allow us to carry the torch for the next generation forward. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Um, you know, traumavation, that's an interesting term. Um, and just taking, you know, what we just discussed now a step further and talking about mm -hmm. that from the lens of Black Lives Matter on the continent of Africa, right? Because I know that's also something that, you know, you're very passionate about. And I can imagine like you using that term traumavation that a lot of the innovation that's coming out is definitely out of a lot of trauma on the continent as well. So I'm guessing, what could you give examples of like, how, you know, what innovative technology that is, you know, again, out of necessity rather than trauma on the continent. If you give like examples of those kind of areas for you. Yeah, I think, you know, when I went to, uh, when I went to Ghana and I'm working on a, <clears throat> well, if I studied what I was going to say, I'm working on a top secret project, but it wouldn't be top secret if I mentioned it, but we, we discussed it in the past. We're building a, a hub actually, um, a 10 acre hub in, in, in Ghana uh, to, Give the next generation of leaders the the right tools and skill sets to be able to achieve greatness and and truly develop things. Um, but as it relates to the question that you just mentioned, um, when I was out there, there were these kids that uh, they created this. It was it, it was super cool. They created this very primitive uh, neural network, um, which a huge problem in Africa is this uh, you know energy, right? So in Ghana, for example, uh, during the day, sometimes the light is turned off um, and at nighttime it's turned on, or sometimes in specific areas, light is turned off for uh, several days, right? And so these uh, kids at this university, they created uh, basically this, this simple um, device. I think it was running on a Raspberry Pi or something. Um, and it would just send a zero or one signal when there was electricity or not. And over time, they were able to aggregate that data and using the neural network, they trained it to predict when the next time uh, the, the light will be turned off. And then they bundled it as an app. And I think that right there is, I think it's it's so smart, right? And I think it was so ingenious because it really came from the perspective of there's nothing like this that exists, right? There's nothing like it that exists. And although, because if you think about it, any problem that's solved is coming from the lack of a solution, right? So inherently, pretty much everything we create comes from a specific level of trauma. But I think what was fascinating about that was that it wasn't, you know, we have this and in some places they have full literacy, in some places they don't. It was a universal problem that every single person, you know, most likely had. And they started on the basis of democratizing that for all, right? And I think that right there is you just one example, one example, right, of sort of the innovation that's happening, you know, in the continent, um, that's so great. And because when I think of Africa, there's so many things that there's no infrastructure around that the chances of pure innovation happening over trauma innovation are, are, are greatly widened, right? Because I even think it's not coming from the perspective of one group of people marginalizing another group. It's coming from a universal uh, a problem that pretty much everyone is is, is most likely facing, right? Mm -hmm. um, or majority of the population is facing. One of those things happens to be a uh, cellular connection. In the United States, majority of us, we pay a monthly bill and we have unlimited internet. We have unlimited 4G or 5G cellular connection. And we have a Wi-Fi router at home that connects us to the internet. Um, majority of us have, you know, okay, even okay internet speeds, which are like, you know, heaven-like speeds in, in, in places like Africa. But as we were even thinking about the curriculums that we wanted to incorporate, we wanted to be uh, a, 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 the academy that we're building in Ghana. We wanted to be one of the first schools that pushed forward visual learning. That was the basis of everything. Everything was visual. So we're gonna create a real-time, uh, uh, it was gonna be a real-time interface. Uh, it was gonna be a GUI interface and you could explore classes in real-time and load them in high precision. But one of the things that we 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 figured out as we were we creating is that there was a bottleneck because not everyone could access the internet unlimited. So what might be free to you in America because you have an unlimited internet that you only pay nine dollars a month or whatever, for students to access resources that sometimes these you know these contents are two gigabytes, three gigabytes, four gigabytes, they have to go buy data bundles two gigabyte data bundles, three gigabyte data bundles, just to get the same information that you get, mm -hmm. right? So that's also like an, 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 another example of, of, of something that I think the solution to that comes from, you know, innovation for all versus, you know, trauma based off of black. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I know I want to be conscious of time and I can go on and on about that, but I can imagine the last point I would say is that, you know, because trauma, 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 innovation, <laughs> I can't even say innovation. Traumavation is usually, you know, a result of someone's specific lack of need or poor experience, right? I can imagine that if we, people going to the opposite spectrum and saying, well, like, you know, a lot of the, for instance, demands that are coming out of Black Lives Matter, which are targeting a specific group, you could say those come from, you know, this um, source of trauma, right? But if we use this notion of like, not innovating off of trauma, they might say, okay, well then, why would we cater to these specific, you know, demands? So it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of a, you know, double-edged sword, but we mm -hmm. that's for a lengthier discussion. But um, I, I want to get to some audience questions, but I do know that you had a demo that you wanted to show. So perhaps you can like go into that first and then we can ask some audience questions. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So um, I think we, we, we sometimes get this question around, um, and if I could just say one more thing as it relates to uh, what, what we had just <laughs> talked about. Um, I think too, there, it's, there's a real importance of, you know, when someone fixes the problem and then other people build on top of that platform because it's not working the way it should, that's, that's what I was relating to, right? Not just yeah. fixing a problem. It's when someone creates something, but either inherently or by mistake forgets to fix some things in it, then yeah. other people building on top of that, you know? uh on, on top of that so i just wanted to uh just yes. kind of clarify that as well but um yeah so i do have a demo here um i'm actually on the screen now here and one of the questions that uh we get a lot are like you know so with spatial labs and all these other companies working on what are some things that we're, we're working on or what are some things or how do we think about some of the processes and i remember when i was 11 and you know the iphone first came out and steve jobs was on the stage unveiling this multi-revolutionary device right, uh, the iPhone. But at the heart of, to me, what I thought was the most important thing was two things, the ecosystem that Apple was creating uh, with iOS at that time, it was just iPhone OS, as well as the revolutionary input device that they created. Because that input device was heavily rooted in empathy, right? Um, why do we use mouses and uh, styluses to control interfaces um, when we can use the greatest input device that, the hum that humans have, which is a finger? Um, but if you think about it, 15, you know, I'll just, I'll, several years later, more than a decade later, um, no one would have thought that the very device, the input device, the multi-touch touchscreen that majority of people use um, would become a breeding ground for a lot of bacteria and things to, to breed on in the era of COVID, right? So at Spatial Life, we really started thinking about how we could create different interfaces that could respond in a very, um, uh, NGL, natural gesture language way. And so we started thinking about how we can leverage and take take that step a little forward. Take what Steve started, which is understanding that the greatest input device was the human hand and multi-touch and things like that, and create interfaces that allow you to communicate with things uh, virtually. And so I'm gonna show you a, a, a little demo. Um, I don't, is a screen on? Uh, on this, yeah. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, so I'm going to show you a little demo of something that we created a, a couple months ago. This is a very early build that we've created. We're, we're far more uh, along now, but this is uh, just what we can share right now. And um, you can also even see some of the things that I addressed uh, earlier um, that we managed to transport into here. Um, one of those was growing up every single time as a as a as a as a black kid, as an African kid. Every single time that I created something, whether I was using an SDK or I was creating the default prefabs that were assigned to me were ones that looked nothing like me, right? So um, whether that was hand tracking or whether that was uh, facial recognition, all these defaulted, even when I was creating, the model that you see is usually like a, a gray or a white model. You don't see anything that even resembles you. So it was important for me to create a device, a hardware solution, but also a software solution that had a dynamic UI, which means that it adapts to the person standing in front of it. So uh, this out this system that I created right here, it actually detects your pigmentation. Uh, your uh, we we capture a pixel uh, from uh, your 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 hand, and so we measure the brightness as well as the um, so the, so the brightness and the darkness, and then we create sort of the the medium value of that and assign it a hex value and assign it to your skin. So if you look at this uh, this demo right here, this is the interface that you control completely with your hands. And you can see my hand on the camera, but if I just wave my hand over here, 
it translates onto the screen in real time. And you can see the color as well also translates to my skin. And I can go in and I can interact with different things by simply waving it over. And this is an early build. And um, we can't really show the, the new build, which is way more advanced than this. Um, but let me close all this out. And let's just say um, this was installed in a public location and I needed to navigate somewhere. I would simply just be able to wave my hand over here and come to maps. And in real time, uh, this map would load. And this is connected to actual server in real time as well as uh, using, uh, I think, the Google Maps API. Um, but I'll be able to just come to navigate. And I'll be able to navigate to where I needed to. If I needed to call a car, I could come within this section right here and click Uber. And um, in real time, it would load all these different things for me. And then I can uh, call a car. So let me show you. Uh, it says travel only if necessary as we work to flatten the curve of COVID-19, remember only uh, necessary travel. So if I click here, then this loads up and then I can select the option of whatever I need. And so this is sort of uh, something we've been creating based on uh, N NGL, which is a natural gesture language. Okay. Um, but this is some of the stuff that we're creating at Spatial Labs. Um, and a lot of the things that I talked about in here, right, the aspirational necessitation, um, the thinking of technology with the inherent for solving problems for as many people as, as you want, right? Even with accessibility, we're creating uh, voice, AP we're using utilizing voice APIs in here as well, as well as um, eye tracking APIs as well, because we understand, you know, not everyone, um, majority of people, right, um, might have, you know, their hands accessible to them, but not everyone, you know, somebody might have had a hand amputated. Well, in that case, and then they can use eye tracking, right? Um, well, what if they're blind? Um, in that case, and they can use voice, right? So we're thinking about how to solve some of these largest issues that are going to not only have been arising from COVID, but is going to be the future of how we communicate with devices and thinking about how we can be prepared for that as well as mit uh, mitigate as much bias as possible from this next evolution of where technology is going, which we feel strongly is volumetrics and spatial reality. So this is uh, the demo that I, I put together for you that I wanted to show you some of the stuff that we were working on, as well as how we're incorporating these concepts that were discussed, um, you know, throughout the talk in here as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back to to the other screen. Yeah. No, that that's awesome, and I yeah I can imagine so many applications, and of course so timely, like you said, with COVID, where no one wants to touch anything. So, <laughs> but um, we maybe will switch to some of the audience questions so that we can you know get some interaction on that end. Great, right, great. Right. So one, the first question is, oftentimes to reach scale, we find ourselves having to adopt to the gatekeepers. If we are the culture and we drive it, how, to, how do we maintain control and power as we drive for innovation? Well, that's a very, very great question that I feel I don't have the full answer to. Um, my, my grandfather used to tell me that sometimes the, the, the best thing you can say is that I don't know. Um, and I don't have the full answer to that, but I think I'm going to do my best to answer it. Um, the thing about control is it's 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 a it's a perception, right? Um, control itself is not a subset of technology at all. Um, technology was never designed to control anybody. It was never designed, or when we ever we create innovation, invention was not designed to control. It was designed to solve, right? But people can actually decide if they want to incorporate the sense of we want to control everything or we want to be on top or whatever it might be. So as it relates to people within the culture um, that create technology and drive forward the innovation, that's simply our job. Our job is to carry the torch, do as much as we can within the, the time period we're running and pass it over to the next generation. And that's how, to me, not only large scale companies are created, um, but uh, also you know some, some of the largest things that we see are created. You think about Linux, you think about uh, Ubuntu or some of these other operating systems um, or even Unix before Apple bought them, um, <laughs> or even Android. A lot of these uh, platforms are open source, right? And they're community built as well as community maintained, right? Uh, a, a lot of them. And I think we need to kind of incorporate that in not our end products, but the development cycle of our ideas. Think of it as an open source project and think about what you might have as one module or uh, one class or one framework or one dependency or library that you built in this universal equation. Um, and more people will continue to add on to that. So I think um, as it relates to control, sometimes even when we create ideas, we're like, I don't want to show this to the world yet because it could get stolen or whatever it might be. But 
at this state and where we are in technology, put the idea out there. If you really want to see it succeed, it doesn't matter who does it or whatever it might be. You have more ideas. Don't worry about that. But put it out there because it's what's needed, right? And if you're working on something that's groundbreaking, that can provide access to everybody and be innovation, I think the sense of control that that that, that sometimes we, we we might get lost in, um, it gets diminished, right? Because uh, the true control is uh, not being dependent on something, not letting something control you, but you controlling it. And so when it relates to even cre the creation of technology, I think that's the best thing for us to simply just innovate and pass it forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see, what's some other questions from the audience? What are your go-to sources for inspiration and how do you maintain your creative energy in 2020? Hashtag mm. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I, 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 I really kind of stopped using social media. Mm. So I was mood boarding things in real time, printing pictures out, putting them on the walls. Um, so I think when I when I have opportunities to either go on, you know, the internet or even, you know, hear music, um, the concepts or the the topic matters that a lot of artists are are thinking about, or a lot of uh, people within the art space or fashion space or music heavily influences um, what I create. Uh, so I think that's how I stay creative, music, arts, and design. Like I'm constantly just looking and looking and looking and seeing what new trends are out and not to follow those trends, but to understand where people are, right? Um, and I think that's something that um, I've always wanted to do. And I'm, 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 I'm grateful that I get to be in a space where I always drop something right on time. It's never too late or it's never too soon. It's right on time. And I think the way I do that is by constantly studying the trends going on at, at a specific time. Um, so yeah, that's 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 how I stay creative in 2020, just by mood boarding, arts, design in real time, but also re reminding yourself that true creativity comes when you disconnect, right? And sometimes we don't even realize it when we're scrolling through the gram or whatever, we're mood boarding in real time. And there was a study that I think they conducted a while back that said that it takes the average human about 14 to 15 minutes to regain peak focus after they've been distracted. So for a lot of us, we're constantly, constantly being distracted. And I think creativity in itself sometimes, sometimes for some people uh, comes from, you know, detachment. And that's how I stay inspired the majority of the time by detachment. Uh, too. That's good. That's good. Uh, how do you utilize your own culture and upbringing and infuse it into your heavily global brand? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I was just talking to someone about this and we were talking about how, um, you know, one thing that I'm extremely grateful for is the ability for my unconventionality to not only be respected, um, but to be welcomed, right? Um, I always did things unconventionally, whether it was my time at Google or uh, my time at Uber or my time at Facebook, even as it exists even now. Um, for me, it's always been about difference, right? Because I never just wanted to be another programmer. I just, I never wanted, you know, to people to mention me as another designer or as another architect. I always wanted to be the unconventional person that had intrinsic value. Because sometimes when you're in a space, you can put your value heavily influenced by what the market tells you or heavily influenced by what you're told your value is. And for me, I always said, I set my value and I'm going to do this very, very differently. So throughout my life, you know, I'm a, I'm a great programmer. I understand seven different programming languages but I'm not the best programmer. I'm a great designer. I've worked on a lot of buildings and a lot of uh, uh, installations with huge icons, but I'm not the best architect. But I think it's the ability to wrap all what I'm good at forward facing in everything that I do that makes me different and helps me expand on my brand. And that's one word of advice that I would like to give to anybody that is in any space. Do not wait for someone to tell you your value. Set your own value. You have your own intrinsic value. and I think about my global reach, local reach, global reach, whatever. Um, the moment thing that sets me apart is, you know, I've always went out and set my value. So now I can go collaborate with a large scale artist, but also negotiate a deal with a major tech company where I own my code every single time I write whatever or whatever it might be, which a lot of people, you know, don't really get. But you're able to set those because you're not only dependent on the opportunity that's provided for you you've created opportunity for yourself. So you're now, you're now sought out instead of others thinking that you need them. 
or they can, you know, enhance your life, right? So you create your own intrinsic value rather than uh, letting it uh, uh, letting it be created for you. And I think that's the number one thing that I would advise anybody, especially if you're within the culture. Your relationships, your value is far more comparable as well as valued more than your skill level. Skills can be attained, you know, we're in, in 2020, we're using all these different programming languages that I'm not going to mention because I don't want to like this AI, but uh, we're using all these different design things or blah, blah, whatever that aren't going to be relevant in the next 10 years. It's inherent, you know, we all have the newest, this device or that device, but two years from now, there's going to, Moore's law don't even make sense anymore because it's not about transistors on a, on, on a silicon wafer anymore, right? So I think what's going to really carry the innovation forward is understanding that intrinsic value that you bring to the table and how you can encompass that in everything you do rather than only relying on your skill sets. That's how I do it. <laughs> mm, awesome. Awesome. Um, what was the most memorable mistake that you've made uh, that you're now today, sorry, glad you've made as a result um, of the lessons you've learned from that mistake? Wow. Um, earlier on, I think in my career, I made a, I made a lot of miscalculations, right? Um, and I think when you're in this space, uh, this space being tech, well, this doesn't happen anymore because of social media everywhere. You know, like people, people will be like, I'm a ride for you, <laughs> you know, hashtag free, free this person or free that person. Um, growing up and despite being 23, I didn't really, you know, have that. Um, I grew up in a world where Wi-Fi was provided at its early stage, but there wasn't Twitter and all these other platforms that people go to for conflict resolution now. Um, so I think earlier on, um, you know, I was I was very I was very uh, sort of naive with uh, a lot of things, uh, especially as it related to creation. And I think I thought that my value was in only the skill sets that I knew. Right. So for me, my value was going to a library and learning JavaScript or Java or Node or you know um, C plus plus or C sharp or, or whatever it might be, and reading the whole book. And in reality when I actually build apps then and now, I only use like one third of that book, right? So it was, it, my, I think my, my biggest thing early on was thinking like to be in the space that I needed to be the best, freshest programmer and the, the most sharp. But in reality, you just need to understand the basic concepts of everything and wrap yourself around what you want to create, right? Yeah. So even when people ask, what programming language should I start with? I can't give you an answer because I need to know what you want to build, right? Yeah. Every single one is different. Uh, what design ethos should I start with first? I can't. I can't give you an answer. It depends on what you want to build. Um, so I think my my biggest memorable mistake, which it, it turned out beautifully earlier on, was thinking that I just need to be a sponge from the perspective of absorbing book knowledge okay. versus actual practice and practical knowledge. Um, but it worked out. It worked out in the end, and it's a double-edged sword. But I I lean more on absorbing the concepts around whatever it is created because those trends come back. Even when you're learning new programming languages, you're still dealing with the same exact things just woven in a different way or things are, you know, done uh, easy, e e you know, easier. The last couple apps I've developed, I've done them completely in um, Flutter, which isn't technically even a programming language. It's a framework just like a, a React Native. Um, but it's gotten the job done and it's made, it's made things very much easier, you know, and I could have some of the things that I, I would have developed in C, C Sharp or C++, um, I, I was able to cut the time in, you know, this is not a promo, but I was, I was able to cut the time by up to 60% using Flutter, you know, which was created by Google. So, so yeah, I would say my, earlier on, my, my biggest thing was, uh, yeah, focusing too much on the book knowledge versus the practical knowledge. Gotcha, for sure, mm. for sure. So I think we have one more question. Um, can you share your favorite design class? And I think you alluded to this a little bit, but um, maybe you want to chime in on that. Uh, Kenny, what, what did I allude to? If you could run me to, No, you, you started related. talking about, well, you talked about generally the two classes you think um, every um, technologist should take. And you mentioned like journalism and then, mm. uh, yeah, but I, this is more specific like design. So maybe oh, yeah. a different class, yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't think I have a favorite one. I really love product design. Um, I love UX um, as well. Um, I took classes on UX, product design, as well as environmental design. Um, I'm really interested in sort of this, this concept of the co co coercion of technology or design or whatever, where it exists. 
Um, and two concepts that I really love um, as it relates to, because I think they're timeless and they can be seen throughout us is biophilia, um, which is talking about the empathy of how nature coexists with, with, with us and biomimicry, which talks about how we can study nature to enhance the world around us, right? There's so many things that instead of us always trying to invent the wheel or doing our best to reinvent the wheel, if we just studied you know, bees or we just studied ants and how they built whatever, we could unlock so much more. But we always wanna like go invent something new out of nowhere that hasn't existed without studying the past. And to create the future, you need to study the, the past. Uh, um, so I think, yeah, I don't have a favorite class. I'm always constantly learning. Um, I used to be very like Bauhaus, minimalism, you know, um, Joseph, uh, Joseph Eichler, who was a very popular SF based architect that pioneered a lot of how Apple's architecture works, um, Frank Lloyd Wright. But now I think studying individuals, you get caught in this loop, which is information of the current is already information of the past. So whatever you're learning inherently is already information of the past, just like that. Just like this talk is already information of the past, right? Um, but I think studying what is a basic unit of how we coexist, which is nature, nature is forever growing, it's ever adapting. And so many solutions around all the problems we will face are found within us. So no favorite design class, but if I had to have a design class, it would probably be nature. That would probably just be the quote of the class. So study nature. Just study nature, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But that's so interesting. It's right. It's like nature is your like you know original playbook, right? And technology it is like that, right? So that's it very is. interesting. Cool, cool, cool. But I mean, this has been a great talk. I just want to leave. Maybe if you give us two short answers um, to the, um, these two questions. The first being, obviously, you've spoken to an audience of generally, you know, technologists or people that work in the technology industry. Just honing in again on that, those concepts around, you know, um, building for marginalized communities, Black Lives Matter, for, you know, um, aspirational necessitation. Like, what are the things that individuals that are currently in, you know, a larger company like Google, what are the, like, what's the one thing that they can do, right, to make an impact in their roles? And then I'll yeah. ask the second question. Okay, so yeah, the first question, if I could answer that shortly, um, I think, you know, just to recap, like aspirational necessitation, right? Creating, uh, uh, using the design thinking that's usually attributed for 5% of products and applying it to 95% of products that people actually need and not just want, right? Then sort of the, the innovation versus trauma We all at some point have to start from trauma but not getting, just not staying there, right? Mm -hmm. I'm growing into, into, into true innovation. Um, and then I think as it relates to, you know, people that might be working at large companies like Google or whatever it might be, which I've had, you know, the amazing um, uh, opportunity to collaborate with Google on a lot of projects. And I'm a collaborator. So everything I do, it's really about weaving in there. So I think people that are at Google, people that are at Facebook, who, wherever, whatever company you might be at, understanding that what you bring, the, the best thing that you bring is not just your skill set and how good you are at designing or or research or marketing, but the cultural aspect that you bring into it. And every single brand has a corporate identity, um, a CID. So if you have a corporate identity, but your corporation stands to be of service to everybody, then your DNA should be involving everyone's culture within it, right? So I would say for all those that are at large companies right now, working on amazing products, do not be shy Do like incorporate your cultural values into these projects. Do not be, you have to be fearless with it, right? And I think for me, that's the number one thing that set me apart that I was, I was not fearless. Well, I was fearless <laughs> to go into any company and be like, hey, these are where, I, this is my values, this is where I come from. Yeah, we could talk about the programming and all that and I can help you fix all of that. But these are sort of my priorities as well, right? I want to grow, I want to scale, but I also want to make sure that as I scale towards this larger goal, that I don't lose myself within it as well. So I think that's my one word of advice. Like think about all the different things that make you you and how you can embed that and not just, you know, putting together a presentation and showing it to, to, to you know, and presenting it to, to, to your boss or whoever and saying, hey, I think we should do this. Mm -hmm. But as you are presented with products, as you're presented with new projects, thinking about all those values that you really greatly care about and how you can incorporate them to maximize those products. And always remember 
that there's somebody that looks just like you that's on the other side that doesn't have the fortune of being at these companies, right? Mm -hmm. So when that person utilizes whatever service, software, hardware that you were part of, you want that person to feel connected, right? So put yourself into that perspective. I owe it to not only myself, but the person that might look just like me, that might not have the fortune of being here to create some sort of memorable moment for them in which they feel connected to this, not just from a, you know, I'm using I'm using this service or device, but I, I feel like a lot of love was put into this, right? And the way that we get there is through incorporation of ourselves and the addition of ourselves into creating this global consciousness as it relates to these companies rather than diminishing ourselves to, to create. No, that, that, that's so good. And and probably somewhat related, my last question is that, you know, this will be, you know, shared. And if, uh, you know, a young, you know, inner city, you know, youth um, in Compton or here in Oakland or, you know, some city in, uh, you know, in Africa and Accra, right? What would you say to them? And they're aspiring to be like you and they see you. Oh, man, you know, one of the biggest things, like, that's so like, uh, for me, it's like, not uh, but like, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm simply on a path towards building. Um, I'm I'm just one brick layer, you know. Um, for this, I'm I'm gonna use like the Great Wall of China uh, as an as an example. The first generation knew they wouldn't finish, but they knew if they put enough blood, sweat, and tears into it, the next generation will continue. So I inherently know that these this larger conversation we're having around how to truly uh, democratize technology um, is a great test. But the beauty of that test in itself is if you knew you would start something but not finish it, would you still do it, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what motivates me every single day, that I'm fighting for things that, and, 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 and larger concepts um, that I probably will, will definitely see the fruits of it on the long term. But for that true level of full scalability, um, I'll, I'll still be a part of it, but the next generation are the ones that are actually going to build and lead on that. And that excites me so much. It excites me so much that we'll live in a, an era where, you know, a, a kid from Compton or a kid from Accra or wherever it might be, might not, you know, will we'll definitely not have to account for the 0.01% of funding that goes to startups, right? Where they will not have to uh, worry about, you know, APIs or frameworks or SDKs that, uh, you know, don't detect their pigmentation or whatever it might be, that they don't have to worry about um, creating a platform because the main platform should have been accessible to everybody. So they have to go create this subset of that platform to only address a specific group. Um, to me, that's what excites me. And um, my advice to all of those people is uh, when you lay that brick, also realize that you're also a brick layer and just continue laying that brick. And at the end of the day, when we step back, right, it's like looking at life through a keyhole. You can, you can barely see it. But when that door is finally open and we see this collage, uh, this mosaic pattern, that's where the beauty sets in. And, and that's our job. Our job is to simply spark the next generation to know that they can believe, achieve, and, 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 and or they can believe and achieve greatness. Um, so that's really it. I, you know, I don't think I can give any advice that is timeless apart from that in itself. That's like the nature proposition of it, that you know, we must remember our roles. And our roles is not to create the end all be all. Our roles as individuals with skill sets is to create something that serves its time and something else comes and kicks in. But what's timeless is the effortlessness, the motivation, the dedication to enhance the world, to enhance your community, to enhance to enhance those of the diaspora, to enhance Africa, to enhance the world. And that is what sparks the next generation to continue. So that's that would be my number one thing. Just pay it forward. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so great. That's so great. And and on that incredibly humble last note, I want to thank you again, Idris, for you know taking the time to like share your insights and your young wisdom <laughs> with all of us. Uh, we always have so much to learn uh, from each other. And with that, uh, thank you again, and we'll see you all soon at the next talk. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.